two, one. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 817. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today is August 18th, 2023. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. We're glad you support the channel. We gl- we're so glad that most of you, not all of you, click the like button right when you see us on Facebook or YouTube. That's very helpful. And we're very helpful that you share this. We're very helpful. We're very thankful that you share this episode with family, friends, and foe. And the, but the most important thing you could do is go to the comment section. We get lots of comments, uh, hundreds each week, about the show, about what you think, about any corrections you want to make in our episodes, and we really appreciate that. The, I always say the show continues in the comments, and if you're not subscribed yet, of course, click the red rectangle, hit the bell, and you'll get instant notifications if YouTube wants to do that. Sometimes they don't. George, how are you doing this week? I am... Um happy as can be uh, the happiest place in the world isn't disney world anymore it's uh, <laughs> it's my little corner of florida Luke we've Canto. been uh, no we've been uh, we've been the stevens ministry uh program nationally has uh asked us to be a pilot program for one of their new study guides on empathy and we held our second session we've got uh, about 30 people in the class and we're studying the concept and how to develop empathy and how to use it in pastoral care and i'm just so excited to see 30 people wanting to come out on a hot day to study empathy so that they can turn around and be ambassadors for christ in a difficult world i mean kevin why wouldn't this be the happiest place on earth (laughs) well that's a difficult topic in this uh, day and age uh to use empathy as a as a skill set uh, mm-hmm. We are constantly barraded by, uh, you know, mass media and social media that uh, uh, we are our, our own kingdom, so we don't have to care what other people think. And mm-hmm. uh, huh, interesting. Uh, we are in Madison for a couple weeks uh, here visiting family and friends, and then we intend to return to Rapid City, where, from what I hear, they're going to have Sasquatch fix. They found the part. Yay. Oh. oh my goodness kevin so, if uh, supply and demand were any indicator you should get into the used rv parts business so i should yes uh it well first of all it's, it's a it's a great opportunity to have downtime and uh you know understand your patients and understand RVing is not just about RVing it's about meeting people it's about uh, developing these relationships and we we've had a great time with our downtime and so we I thought, thought RV we, we really, Kevin, yeah. I thought it was about standing and under a dripping uh, uh dripping transmission and ripping up hundred dollar bills. I thought that's, <laughs> that's what right. the fun of RVing was. Uh, some YouTuber uh RV person put out a video and made fun of every repair is a thousand dollars. That'll be a thousand, that'll be a thousand. And I tell you what, there's truth to that. But Mm-hmm. We shall move on to the news, but uh, if, you, if you're listening closely, Sasquatch shall re- be repaired within a couple weeks, and we will be back on the road, and that shall be fun. But people around the nation and around the world are not having a lot of fun the last couple weeks, and we have to report on that, uh, especially the, Ma- the Maui fires. Um, we, d- yes. have no idea, we have no idea yet of the death toll, uh, because many people have been completely incinerated, uh, they sent out the experts from 9-11 Towers who helped uh, do DNA testing and figure out uh, whose remains were whose. They've now been dispatched to Maui to do the same because reports, the latest reports, are thirteen to 1,400 people are unaccounted for, mostly children. Yes, the schools were uh, dismissed because of high winds from the hurricane that was offshore that was blowing the winds, but most parents were still working and the fires broke out and no alarms were raised. And so the children who uh, are used to these uh, sirens going off with tsunami warnings and other sort of natural disasters, those were not raised. And the government official statistics, right now it's a little over 100, 
but those are only bodies that they are able to completely identify with dental records or with some sort of identification. Uh, so most of these people, according to one news source, are those that, that were found floating in the harbor. Uh, they weren't, their bodies weren't burned. They were those who uh, suffocated in the fire and had jumped into the sea to try to be saved. What's the problem is with this firestorm, which to my eyes was uh, akin to like the bombing of Hamburg or Dresden during the war where a giant firestorm yeah. rise, raising the temperature to hundreds of degrees above a normal fire has incinerated almost all biological remains. And at this stage, 2,000 people are still missing. The Episcopal Church in downtown Lahaina, uh, Holy Innocence Episcopal Church, it has been completely wiped out along with its vicarage and school and church office buildings. Uh, there are three or four other Episcopal churches on Maui and one ACNA, I think there's an ACNA congregation. They are all okay, but the one in the little cutesy town of Lahaina is completely gone. Uh, we don't know any we don't have any casualty figures because the government's keeping a tight lid on these things. It's a terrible situation. No, it's really horrible. I mean, and we find this at least every other year where something in uh, uh, the world happens that's just unexplainable. Mm -hmm. Boom, we, we lost a thousand people. What, what do you mean? I was I was watching ESPN. I turned the channel. And there's a fire in, in in a popular resort in in Hawaii. I, I I don't understand, and that's part of just this nature we have here in the world. It's a uh, you know there's lava flows, there's earthquakes, there's hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, people die, and we as a church have to recognize how to respond to that. How do we respond to Maui without just wasting money? Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's so many needs. I, I'm Facebook friends with the Bishop of the Arctic, David uh, Parsons. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, the city of town of Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories, along with some other smaller communities, have been evacuated by the territorial government because of raging wildfires in the Northwest Territories. Uh, all summer, we've been hearing about poor air quality from the Midwest all over to, up, over to New York. Well, it's from these fires, and the fires are now approaching the settled areas in the Northwest Territories. So the bishop uh, got in his RV, or got in his camper, in his truck in his camper, and then evacuated south, and the CBC is showing uh, uh, lines at the airport of people being flown out. They still have to pay $272 for a ticket to get out, so some people who don't have a car and don't have money, uh, it's looking pretty grim for them. But you know, there's that need in to our neighbors to the north in the Arctic, because yeah. what's going to happen if the fire passes through Yellowknife? And but then we can go all the way around the world to all these tragedies and terrible things that are happening uh, due to nature or due to man's inhumanity to man. And you're going to find that's kind of the theme of episode 817 as we talk about uh, certainly natural disasters, but man-made disasters at all, at, as and well. In, in my Sunday uh, adult education, I was asked, George, would you talk about the end times? Because are we entering the end times? And quick answer, so you don't have to come and miss it. No, uh, <laughs> no man knows. <laughs> so don't look for the fires in Maui to be an indicator, or uh, Joe Biden being the Antichrist. Not even Barack Obama is the Antichrist. So, uh, Well, if you'll be technical... Yeah, if you want to be technical, any time after Christ's resurrection was the beginning of the end times. We mm -hmm. just don't know the dates. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a common uh, topic that keeps coming up because there's an internet, George. There's a place where people can go and gather and troll and you know, express their ideas and opinions and not listen to any others. And um, the, is this the end times to them? Absolutely. Is Biden the Antichrist? Well, <laughs> according to them, he is. And, and you see some stuff that makes me sort of chuckle because the, the Catholic parish in Lahaina wasn't burned down. And so all the Catholic internet is, you know, here's an act, you know, the Virgin Mary has come and taken care of all this. Well, neither was Oprah Winfrey, Bill Gates, or Barack Obama's house burned down. So, yeah. you know, were the yeah. saints working extra time for these people or was it just the way, you know, natural disasters unfold? Uh, construction, I think. Or yeah. did... 
the, the, the thinking that it was power lines that uh, came down and the electricity was still on and we had dry vegetation and that sparked it, the fires, and then the hurricane force winds just turned it into the firestorm. Could it be that around the giant estates and in the Catholic Church, they had buried power lines, so there was nothing to come down? Whereas in the old uh, tourist town, they still have all the foam poles and the power lines that can pop over in a storm. All right, George, let's go overseas. The Synod of Tanzania has met, and they are trying to discuss sex in schools. You know, what role does the church has? What should we teach? What should we suggest be taught? And uh, it's interesting because we're going to see some outside influence here. Yeah, I, I saw this uh, through the median of the Australian, which is with the National Australian newspaper. It's a liberal newspaper, like most of them are. And it its angle was transgender activists uh, angered at, tra at transphobic actions by Tasmanian Synod. Well, the Synod met, uh, I think, the end of July, and th they discussed a number of things of local concern. And one of the issues raised was that Tasmanian Diocese has a number of church-affiliated schools. Now, a church-affiliated school is like it in the United States. It has an Anglican ethos, but it's not day-to-day -day operations are run by an independent trust. It's not run by the bishop who looks over everybody's homework and makes sure all this and that. And the question was raised, what do we teach about men and women and transgenderism and biology? And the Synod affirmed that uh, our, we encourage and we ask that our schools teach science, not ideology. That, you know, there's men and women, some have XX, some have XY chromosomes. There are always that one in a million who's got XXY or whatever. But point being is that we will not jump on the transgender bandwagon and we will not encourage special accommodations, special facilities, special classes. We'll not fire teachers who refuse to uh, teach the latest transgender loony bin stuff. And this is, this is contrary to how the Church of England school systems are operating. It's how some some Catholic school systems in the United States are firing. There was a professor at a Catholic university who taught biology for 30 years and just got fired because students objected to his biological rigorism, which they thought was offensive. And I guess since the kids pay the bills, they, they can fire the teacher. Yeah. But so They're Tasmania has, though. yeah, Tasmania uh, and its Bishop Richard Condy, who was the past chairman of GAFCON Australia, has uh, entered the uh, bad books of the transgender movement in Australia, and I'm sure they're going to get beaten up from now on. Oh, and they also said the Church of England made a mistake in adopting gay blessings and whatnot. Well, 2023 is different from 1984 in this way. Now science equals hate. Mm -hmm. Reason equals hate. Math equals hate. Uh, you know, Westernism equals hate. Um, every time they find something that completely disputes and their ideas, they call it hate. And so we reach this point where we're, we're devolving as a society. Mm -hmm. We reached a, a, a point, I don't know when we started devolving, probably seven, eight years ago. I don't know, it could have been longer. As a species, we don't have much future if we can't identify what a man is, what a woman is. Women are now egg producers. They're not mothers. They're not women. Yeah, just, oh, George. So. Well, it, I think it, we're, we're in such a funny place that Richard Condy, an evangelical Anglican bishop, is hated with equal fervor as J.K. Rowling, a social liberal writer, or Richard Dawkins, an atheist professor, who maintains the biological determinism of sex. So Dawkins and Condi and Rowling are all got targets painted on them with the transgender people firing their arrows at them. It's interesting because I was watching a couple of YouTube interviews with Richard and he defends transgenderism much with much more rigor than he does atheism. Mm -hmm. You know, I, he's at best a pseudo atheist with some of his, uh, 
uh, fallacies and stuff like that. But he's he's nailed it on transgenderism. So, oh. yeah, you know, Maya's right. Let's move on and talk about Pakistan because uh, all hell is breaking loose there for many different reasons. Mostly, we talk about this uh, many times in the last 12 years, power vacuums. Uh, you know, right now, Pakistan doesn't have a leader uh, or a good leadership in place. And that allows uh, little, you know, minor terrorist groups to, to go and spread rumors and kill Christians. And that's what we have happening, George. Yeah, earlier this year, the CIA helped topple Imran Khan, the prime minister. And because Khan was playing footsie with the Chinese and the Russians, and he wasn't being a good client state to the U.S., the U.S. helped those elements within the Pakistan government who didn't like Khan to take over. So the strong man was out, and we're now in a period of semi-anarchy. And in this period of semi-anarchy, when there's no strong government, this is, as you say, when the crazies can run riot. And in the eastern city of, I have to look it up, because I didn't know it existed, Jaranawala, uh, Jaranawala, uh, two Christian men were accused of defacing pages of the Quran. And this enraged a mob who then proceeded to lynch a few people, according to reports I've received, burn down two churches in a Salvation Army hall, destroy dozens of the homes of Christians, and over a thousand Christians had to flee the city and take, spend the night in fields outside the city until the army came and restored order. 129 people have been arrested, the Associated Press reports, including the two Christians for blasphemy. And they'll probably get the death penalty for that, whether it's true or not, it's immaterial. But the, the situation in Pakistan politically, socially, is just a mess. And unfortunately, the Church of Pakistan is not in a strong place right now. Recently, uh, there's been a dispute over the Diocese of Lahore in January, uh, what was his name? Uh, Nadim Karam was elected and consecrated bishop. Now, Lahore is the wealthiest of the Church of Pakistan diocese. The National Church objected, saying, we have to oversee this election and approve it, sort of like the Charlie Holt syndrome in the U.S., where you can elect him, but we have to approve it, or you have to go through these hoops. Well, the three retired bishops went and consecrated in January 18th, on January 18th, Nadim Karam. They were Alexander Malik, former moderator, long-term Gafcon and conservative primate, Sami Azariah, former primate of Pakistan, and Ifram Jamil, yes, was the third bishop. Well, the Synod in Pakistan has effectively deposed three, three bishops from the House of Bishops of the Church of Pakistan. They're playing hardball. And so the money is being spent on lawyers. Who's the true Bishop of Lahore? Meanwhile, ordinary Christians are being subjected to persecution, uh, kidnappings of young girls to become forcibly converted to Islam and married off to men. It's a bad situation. And the church is not in a place to, to strongly contest this decline of society in well, Pakistan. The vacuum is not just at the secular level. The vacuum is also at the leadership level of the church. Uh, mm -hmm. The church has left a vacuum. And when uh, the Islamic people see that the church is squabbling and fighting over uh, bishops, stuff like that, eh, we can help out here. We'll cause chaos. We'll further take down the Christian church, which they've clearly done uh, very well. Now, Pakistan right now is still suffering a horrible economic crisis post-COVID. They've not recovered any way, shape, or form. Their banking system is uh, broken. Uh, clearly the government is absolutely corrupt. And any foreign aid getting in there is not getting to the people. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't read anything yet about starvation uh, level areas, but, you know, it, it could certainly happen. Let's move on and talk about... I'm going to move this list we have up. Let's talk about China real quick, because... It does relate to Pakistan. Um, if you don't know, uh, China has enslaved a body of people uh, uh, in uh, the northern regions of China. They don't have respect for religion. They don't have respect for others who are not Asian. And 
we are seeing that drastically working its way out in the Christian population of China. China has gone, for all intents and purposes, completely gangsta on Christians. And, you know, it, it's hard to be watching this because we don't get the news from China. And if you're going to report on this, you're going to get kicked out of China. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the or, reports. Or if you're Bloomberg News Services, you're partially owned by China. And you're therefore you, China, yeah. you uh, or if you're the Fox Network. Uh, well, so the, let, let's, set, let's set this up. China um, has had a one child policy up until about six or seven years ago or a dozen years ago. And that completely set up for future chaos and e economic destruction, which is now playing itself out. The largest realtor and banking system in China this week filed for bankruptcy uh, because yeah. there, there's all this debt that nobody's paying because nobody's making families or babies. Oops, well, one child, well, how, how could that go wrong? Mm -hmm. China has suffered COVID like none other because they had a complete lockdown. Uh, shutting down industries all over China that produce products for the West. Prescriptions, uh, uh, cheap uh, um, IT products and stuff like that. So China's trying to wake up from COVID and finds out that their society is shrink, shrinking in population because they don't have the ability to reproduce themselves, George. This is a very complex story so i hope mm -hmm. our, our viewers walk with put your, me in this. put your seatbelt on sit back china has always had something called the mandate of heaven where dynasties or people in power are changed when the gods turn against them and this usually takes the forms of natural disasters and floods the beijing peking has had the worst flooding in 140 years such that Tiananmen Square was submerged underwater. And Peking is diverting the flooding into the rural areas around it. And they have hidden from the West all reports of casualties, damages, destruction of infrastructure, truck, uh, crops and whatnot. It's really bad. And, and so we don't, so officially 36 people have died. Well, the, is wrong by a factor experts say of about a hundred to a thousand could be 3600 or 36,000 and the chinese government does not want the population to know this has happened this is bad because this will question the legitimacy of the government now this follows a collapsing economy in China. China this month stopped reporting youth unemployment because it was now approaching 50%. China has this month stopped reporting its dark foreign currency reserves. China, you know, sells all this stuff. You go to Walmart, everything's from China. You would think they've yeah. got a lot of US dollars and they're huge exporter. Their dollar supply has been shrinking in China because they need to cover their losses internally. And then you have the real estate crisis, Evergrande, which is char China's largest developer, has a 500 billion, billion bankruptcy filing in Manhattan, Chapter 15, which is the chapter that applies to multinational corporations so that they get the advantage of US law as opposed to Chinese law. All of this comes at a time of increased persecution of religious people. We see this particularly with the Uyghurs in the western areas, northern and western areas of China. And September 1st, new laws come into effect that regulate the Christians. And these new laws uh, are coupled with uh, clergy arrests, the destruction of churches, toppling of crosses, um, removal of the Ten Commandments and other biblical sayings from the walls of churches to be replaced by the statements of Chairman Xi and reports that every sermon, the content must be basically cleared by the party and it may not contradict any CCP, Chinese Communist Party or Chairman Xi fought. And if you do, you get arrested for treason. Um, what's happening is what Nero did to the Christians, uh, persecute them because Rome is burning to basically uh, refocus the anger of people. 
And part of Xi's work is that these Christians in China all have any tens of millions of them. They're really under the influence of devious, malicious foreigners. And uh, we can uh, make China a better place by stamping it out. So the prospects for the public church under the current regime are pretty bleak, yeah. in my opinion, in China. And we yeah, need to pray. And, and in Hong Kong, they're introducing mainland laws. So the open expression of religion, which was always part of Hong Kong's environment, it's going to be under co constraints as well. I would say now Taiwan is at its safest place, uh, you know, at least for the, the foreseeable future, because China just witnessed all the uh, armament that they bought from Russia not work uh, against Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So they're like, okay, all those tanks, probably pretty useless. Um, all those missile systems, not going to work. Uh, so I don't think Taiwan is the main focus, but they may be just to keep people interested and not on their economy, but on other things, be threatening to Taiwan. I think you know, you're right on that point, Kevin. To, yeah. It's a distraction. I mean, they don't have the... They've got a trillion dollar real estate crisis. They've got to put money into that or the Chinese uh, establishment, nomenclatura, the Chinese, the, the, the party cadres, they're the ones who've bought the second houses and now the developer has, has folded and they're out all their money and they you know, they're, they're going to take the pain, not the peasant in the field. He'll just starve. But the party cadres that sort of run the country, they're the ones taking the financial hit. And so the Chinese government can decide, am I going to spend a trillion dollars to try to take over Taiwan, or are we going to try to stabilize the economy? And I think they'll try to stabilize the economy by saying nasty, mean things to Taiwan and the Philippines and Vietnam, just to be seen to be strong when they really don't have the ability to act upon their, their words. But they do well, have think, the ability to persecute a pastor, sure. uh, a, a Bible study leader, and throw them in prison or disappear them. We do. I do remember watching lots of people uh, complain and be very unhappy with the party, uh, with the, the CCP during COVID. Uh, they were locked down. They were not getting fed the way they wanted to get fed. Their apartment complexes were locked down. Uh, everybody was wearing white uh, biological uniforms. And I wonder if that's going to be cause enough destabilization long-term in the country that it would put the party at risk, uh, put communism at risk. If they don't have money and they don't have food uh, and people start starving like they did uh, you know, 80 years ago, what happens, George? You know? Well, that it, it's... I don't know. Uh, yeah. They Mao survived the great leap forward where 40 million Chinese died of starvation, but they died in the countryside. They were peasants. They, they didn't did. matter. If this yeah. time around, if the collapses in the cities and in the industries and among the middle classes, China's rising middle class and the cadres in the party, perhaps we'll see some sort of change. I don't know. But we are at a nice edge point in China, um, as we are in so many other places in the world. Indeed. Let's uh, move back local. We'll go to the Church of England. Uh, the society has said, listen, we need to make some recommendations here to protect the seal of confession. Something you and I talked about, you know, maybe five or ten times over the years uh, as it pertains to Anglicanism. Uh, in the confession... Uh, in certain regions of the world, if you confess something to your priest, he keeps it secret. There's this internal bond between you and the priest where no matter what you tell him, no matter how bad, there's a seal. And that's written in books. That's written into, if I remember correctly, the prayer book of the Episcopal Church. And I yes. thought this is a great time to talk about it because it's brought up again in the news. First of all, George, who is the society? The Society are the Anglo-Catholic bishops of the Church of England. They're the ones who are centered around opposition to the ordination of women priests. They have they come from the Anglo-Catholic uh, side of the equation. And there's it's something called ICSA, the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse in England, which has been investigating 
schools, churches, all sorts of things, how they've been handling it. And they've come up with recommendations to the government that came out in April of this year, I believe. And one of those recommendations is mandatory rebuting, reporting of child abuse. So if you're a teacher in a school and you suspect child abuse or a child tells you this, you must tell the police or social agency, whoever they to require you to inform. And it has also been, and the Church of England in 2019, as they were studying this, the government said, we agree, we need to have reporting of child abuse, but we have to stop the line of the seal of confession, where when if a penitent comes to a priest to confess a sin, and that sin includes child abuse, that priest cannot be compelled to inform on the penitent to the government because that would violate canon law and religious freedom. That was stated in 2019 by the Church of England. Well, ICSA ignored this and is telling the government to junk the seal of confession. And in uh, this past Wednesday, the bishops of the society released a letter saying, urging the government and ICSA to give the church an exception and laying out the from their position, the uh, rationale for keeping uh, the seal of confession. On a practical level, there's never been a case of somebody confessing in the Church of England uh, sin like this and it not being acted upon. In other words, right. there's never been a case where a priest knew about this and years later it came out that they, the, acute, the, the, the bad actor had told his priest and the priest didn't act. It's never happened. First point. Second, it would be an unconscionable interference in religious liberty and freedom because this is a Christian doctrine, they say. And third, how would in practical purposes work? How, you know, what guidelines would there be? How would you, in other words, just the mechanics of making it happen would be almost, would be impractical. But the primary thing is that this is contrary to church doctrine. So that's the letter that came out. Now, in the past, we've recovered this issue, and this has generated probably the most exciting hate mail I've ever gotten uh, <laughs> on this well, topic. In, in talking in general terms, uh, here in America, uh, the most states require priests to report this type of things. Once you've hit a certain threshold, uh, limit switch, whatever, you're required to, okay, uh, somebody in the congregation told me this, or it happened in confession, and you need to contact the police in, in some states in America. I don't know about all of them. Uh, I think Florida, we have to contact the, the uh, police. Yeah, we're mandatory reporters in Florida. Yeah. Now, um, this is made difficult for the society uh, bishops because in 2014, Australia went through this. They were coming off of a big series of clergy abuse scandals, both Catholic and Anglican. And the government said, uh, look, no more, uh, no more sealed confession. And the Synod of the Church of Australia in 2014 said, okay, the seal can be violated for cases of child abuse. Mm -hmm. And the primate, Philip Frere, of Archbishop of Melbourne, pointed out that uh, the Anglican reformers were not keen on auricular confession private personal confession. They were keen on confession of sin in the Eucharist, uh, but not in going to a priest to tell your things privately. And then they went on to say that auricular confession in a Catholic mode was all but unknown in Anglicanism until the Catholic revival of the 19th century. Therefore, it's a recent innovation. Therefore, it's something that we can waive. Now, for those of a Catholic persuasion in the Anglican world, this is heresy. This I will right. go to yeah. prison before I do this. For sure. those of an evangelical bent, um, it's not really a big deal because we don't operate on that level. Uh, but, you know, it's still a difficult issue. Uh, it, it becomes difficult because the secular government is encroaching upon religious freedoms. Mm-hmm. Does this make sense? Yes, in a practical, reasonable sense, this makes sense that if somebody confesses um, this type of sin, it should be reported to 
the police practically. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if this person is, you know, uh, it's a pastoral thing, if anything. But it, it's, you know, what's the Episcopal Church's stance on this, George? Well, we have, uh, we're divided. We have the prayer book that says these things must be kept in confidence. Mm-hmm. And if you violate this conf- confidence, you are, beca- because you are acting, the, the person is not confessing to you, he's confessing to God these sins. And you are giving the absolution and blessings to the church and God. You're not giving your own personal uh, response or blessing. Therefore, technically you're not hearing this god is hearing this you're just the vehicle or the median medium um so that the church on the one hand has its prayer book say this but then we have ordinances and local rules that say you're mandatory reporter and if somebody comes to you and says uh you know father i want to talk to you about this issue you've got to stop saying wait a second if it's dealing with sexual abuse of children just know that uh, that you can tell me you murdered your wife i don't have to tell anybody but if you tell me you molested a child i have to tell somebody i'm being arch here but those are sort of the rules that we're living with because they're not really well thought out or organized Uh, it's like being half pregnant we're sort of half there half not there you know but you can't be it's either totally or not at all all right well let's move on to some other news here next on my docket is uh Bishop Stuart Ruck uh, has been brought up on charges, is going to face trial, an ecclesial trial here in the Anglican Church in North America. Full stop here. Kevin is biased in this. I am a fan of Bishop Stuart Ruck. I've uh, known him many years. I've uh, filmed his consecration. I uh, have enjoyed the fruits of his labors. And probably not the best person to report on this. But I. Uh, you know, I'm biased. George, you're probably biased in this as well. Yes, because I, I think he looks like uh, part of the 70s revival tour of Herman oh, the, the Herbert. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he wears the best. Uh, but <laughs> when this story broke, it broke with the formal announcement of the ACNA, and I sat on it for a day because I wanted to wait to see what Bishop Brooks said. Because if I ran sure. with that alone, that would give the nasties free reign right okay. so i went for so as soon as he put out his statement which he released first to the diocese of the upper midwest and we got a copy of that when it came out we put that out mm-hmm. and then the next morning we put out the official acne stuff uh he's accused of a, a trial a panel of inquiry found that there was a prima facie case uh not a proven case but just on the surface if you believe the accusations because no defense has been offered, but if you believe right. the accusations, if he did these things, then yes, he should go to trial. Hasn't found that he did them, but rather if he did what he's accused of, he should be tried for conduct unbecoming a member of the clergy, violation of ordination vows. And it's frustrating for some people because the exact charges that on certain day he did such and such and such and such have not been made public. But for this whole process we can basically say it deals with failure to properly abide by acna rules governing lay case of lay sexual abuse now my my interest in this and my problem is for all intents and purposes stuart rock and the diocese and the clergy in the diocese was exonerated by an outside investigation firm they came in, mm-hmm. looked at all the emails, looked at all the conversation, did all these extensive interviews, um, and named names in these interviews. And reading this report that was uh, put out, is it a, was it last year? Whenever it was put out, we read through the report, and it's they're, they're not a legal entity; they can't exonerate. But my reading of it was they've been exonerated. They they did nothing wrong. There's things they could have done better. Okay, is that the standard now uh, that we hold that some, you know, you didn't do anything wrong, but you could have done better. Is that is that the standard now for the ecclesial body? Now, Stuart uh, Ruck put out in his statement that this has been an accusation that's been circling around uh, his diocese now for a, a couple months. You and I have seen it um, and that it, there's nothing new in this. And I think there's, you know, he's right in that. 
Uh, there, there are people in his diocese, not a lot, who, you know, for whatever reason, think that uh, he could be doing a better job. I don't know. The my my take and my opinion, which is not the facts, but my opinion, right. <laughs> is he's not had the best advice legally. Book, yeah, legally. In other words, he went through this whole business of legal challenges and things of that nature. And when you do, when you fight on the letter of the law, there's always sort of a well, what's he trying to hide? And that caused Acne to have a brief flurry of uh, uh, knives coming out and jabbing well, people in the dark. They and, called it a canonical crisis, and it was. Yeah, yeah. Well, if they're going to have crises. Let them be those sorts of crises, not financial or economic. But I, but his response to this presentment was his best bit of PR, and it looks like he didn't have his lawyers write it. He he said yeah. it. We basically said, you know, I am. I look forward to being able to be put these charges to rest, and so a trial will allow will either exonerate or convict him. And if it's exonerated, it's done. It's over. And I sort of compare it to what happened to Bishop Cliff up in Ontario, who was suspended on super secret charges. That's right. Yeah. Dean Wormer put him on double secret probation. Uh, it's an Animal House uh, reference for those under the age of 60 or 50. And then three months later, the Archbishop of Ontario, province of Ontario, said, oh, well, never mind, forget about it. And it didn't exonerate him. It's just it just sort of left it hanging. I think it's much better this way to be transparent and either prove or disprove these charges. And if they're disproven, it's done. Mm -hmm. If it's proven, then the then the appropriate penalty would be asked. And Bishop Beach or whoever is the final decision maker would go forward. Yeah. Uh, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, I keep the entire situation in your prayers. Now, Ironically, the ACNA looked really good in this because they found a canonical error. They found something that wasn't a system that wasn't working, and they fixed it at the very next meeting mm -hmm. uh, of the the House of Bishops or College of Bishops. They they said, "Hey, there's a problem. It's been identified, and three or four different solutions were worked out. And now there's not a problem with uh, how to uh, bring a bishop to trial." So, the, the ACNA. Uh, for a moment, looked completely helpless and came out looking pretty good here. Uh, you posted a obituary of Jeremy Marshall, a person I've never heard of, and you were talking to me in pre-show and describing uh, what he was doing and helping the evangelicals in the Church of England, and he seems like a, a person that we're going to miss, George. This is insiders baseball. Insiders, insiders baseball. Uh, about the Church of England, so... Do they have a f phrase, <laughs> insider's cricket? Insider's cricket, yes. <laughs> Jeremy Marshall died of cancer. He'd been suffering for about 10 years. He was given about 18 months to live about eight years ago, but he lasted 10 years. Marshall had been the uh, chairman of Whores and Company, which is one of Britain's largest private banks. Very wealthy man in the city. Devout evangelical Christian, the son of a, uh, an independent minister. Marshall died. Marshall his death creates a tremendous vacuum in the evangelical conservative world. Here is a man of very strong leadership qualities and financial resources who helped mold and bankrupt the opposition to the liberalization of the Church of England. He helped fund uh, Premier Christian Radio. He paid their salaries on a few occasions when the, they didn't have the money to do it. He helped find the money to fund uh, staff positions for the Church of England Evangelical Council so that the, the bishop and uh, John Dunnett, uh, Dunnett, Dunnett the, the executive director, and then they had a half-time uh, communications person, had salaries so that this organization could be an effective advocate. He also was an advocate for taking the fight to the enemy. Yeah. He died. And there's a tremendous vacuum now in the evangelical world of 
lay evangelical world in England. And this comes at a very bad time, just as the battle's being joined with the establishment. Uh, one of their premier strategists and money men is uh, taken off the field. So we, well, we pray for his family, that they have peace at this time. And we also pray for the organizations that he helped fund and run and that they not uh, Crumble. lose prominence because yeah. they, they've lost uh, cash flow. Yeah. So, okay, cool. Uh, let's do a quick follow-up to Charlie Holt. He uh, wrote a another thing we posted on Anglica.inc explaining what's going on, and he's taking a parish in Jacksonville, Florida, and does not intend to proceed and pursue being a bishop in the Diocese of Florida, George. If nominated, he would not stand. If elected, he would yeah. not serve. He's doing a Lyndon Johnson. He's not going to run a third time in Florida. Charlie Holt announced that he had been called to be rector of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Jacksonville, which is a lovely major parish in the city of Jacksonville. Yeah, yeah. He'll be very happy there. Um, he has a, a connection from his college days um, to that particular parish. Um, he's landed on his feet, and he's now basically going to have fun again doing the parish ministry at a parish that is happy and successful. Uh, it looks like St. Florida you know, will go the route of a provisional bishop. Sam Howard retires six months, eight months. He retires in the next year or so. It's 72. And they don't have the will or I think even the money to run through this process again so quickly. So my guess is that they'll hire a provisional bishop, a retired bishop, to come in and allow the temperature to come down a bit in the diocese. Because people are angry, they're frustrated. A, minor a vocal and mean-spirited minority, some believe, have harmed a good man. And so if the mean-spirited minority wants X, the majority is going to say, no, we want Y. And so the standing committee is probably going to try to find somebody who can sort of repair the breach, who doesn't have a dog in the fight because he's only there for a year or two or three years, and then go forward. Uh -huh. The difficulty is, with a provisional bishop, you can get some changes. North Dakota, North Dakota was always one of the conservative dioceses, and then and when Michael Smith retired and went to Albany, went to Dallas and then has now been at Albany, they got Tom Ely, the former Bishop of Vermont. And while Ely was there, North Dakota drank the Kool-Aid. Gay clergy, gay blessings, gay this, gay that. And last week we reported about the transgender service uh, that they're doing in the North Dakota parish in Fargo. Uh, so the, the renaming service, yes. Renaming. So Howard had declined to allow non-celibate gays and lesbians to take up posts within the diocese from outside. The uh, interim bishop, if they get somebody like Tom Ely, a liberal, can bring in as many of these people as they want so the liberals can see their ranks swell. So the, di the standing committee, which shares Howard's and Charlie Holt's view of the, this issue, it's going to have to walk a delicate line. How do we uh, get a reconciliation without giving away the store on issues that are of gospel importance to us? I, I, and I don't think they can. This is how the Diocese of Connecticut fell in the mid-90s. You know, just a slow progression. Uh, the, the conservatives lost an election, um, and boom, and came a liberal, and just let the, that tide flow in. That liberal mm -hmm. tide flowing to the diocese, boom, happened in Alabama. Alabama, the same thing. Uh, you know, just a, a bishop, kind of wishy-washy at the time in the in the mid nineties, uh, and allowed the the tide to flow because he he didn't want to have any of his clergy to do anything with um, the AEC or anybody else. Just hold the line, and holding the line in the Episcopal Church is losing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it just is. So 
Diocese of Colorado. I we could we could sit here for two hours and go through each diocese. Diocese of the Rio Grande. Uh, Rio Grande and, and name the date that they got the bad bishop that allowed the tide to come through. Yeah. Now Central Florida is lucky because it's a desirable place to live in the country. Mm -hmm. So when you're I live sixty there. years when you're sixty years old and you're in upstate New York and you're a priest yeah. and you want the last five to ten years, what's happening in Florida? So yeah. we have a choice of clergy, whereas they don't have a choice in Syracuse or Buffalo or places like that. Yeah. Second, we've got 30 people in the ordination process. So we've got younger people coming up the ladder. Um, so we're not lacking for clergy. And because of that, we can sort of maintain the integrity of who we are. And we now have a bishop who is 10 years younger than I am, and I hate him for that. Never, <laughs> I hate that. But so that means he's got 20 years. I've got yeah. 10. He's got 20 years. And he is not going to change the character of the diocese. But he's got to be clever and not get hammered or nailed yeah. uh, by the national church. So we'll see how this all works out. He's the token for now. Uh, let's move on and talk some more parish news. Um, and Acne Parish has moved to Nigeria. Um, now, I, I don't want this to seem that we're complaining about the Nigerians. Uh, every Nigerian I know who's come from the Nigerian homeland and has come here to America is a businessman, is successful. Many, many are millionaires. Uh, they go, attend our schools. They come out, you know, with doctor degrees. A Nigerian is kind of the frontiersman an American was uh, 200, 250 years ago. They, they plus, know how to, yeah. Plus, they're the squeegee guy in Times Squares, in Times Square. Yeah, yeah absolutely. They're, boom, they're, 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 there's no, I've never met an unemployed Nigerian here in America. And so they are go getters. So, I, 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 this is not a complaint in any way about Nigeria. Other than maybe ecclesiastically, uh, a act of parish has moved to Nigeria on American shores, George. Yes, uh, Christ the King in College Park in Maryland, which is a suburb of Washington, it's D.C., sort of on the northeastern yeah. side. University of Maryland's there. Uh, has moved from the Diocese of the Living Word to the Anglican Diocese of the Trinity. So that's the third act of parish in a about a month, two months to leave. Two went to the Episcopal Church and one and now one to the church of nigeria um the indiana no not two months but in this year yeah it, it, in six months six months. well and the this this is a nigerian congregation that uh, when cana broke up stayed with the diocese of the living word under julian dobbs and has now made the, de the decision to move at, over to the Church of Nigeria's presence in the United States. This is in line with the speech given by the primate of Nigeria, Henry Ndikuba, which we reported last week, where he backs the Nigerian mission work amongst the Nigerian diaspora in the US, in Canada, in Europe, in, in the Persian Gulf and all these places, so that the Church of Nigeria is telling Nigerians who've moved to the U.S. you can still be part of the Church of Nigeria and don't, how should I say, don't acculturate yourself to the local expression of, of faithful Anglicanism, mm -hmm. which is not the vision that Peter Akinola had uh, 20 years ago. So we're, we're seeing the pendulum swing the other way, which is... Uh, unfortunate in my mind i've heard much frustration expressed at higher levels in the acna about this situation that continues with nigeria i've heard that there's been loud conversations between primates uh about this uh um situation and for you know some of us uh, just a, a cultural understanding the nigerian people i know and love are this way they they you know they for good or bad you know they you know they they command the room so to speak so 
Yeah, that's that's well, one story. <laughs> yeah. Well, at the same time, we have to say I think the way the Anglican Diocese of the Living Word and the Diocese of the Trinity are handling this is is much better witness to the world than the way the Episcopal Church has handled this with people leaving. Uh, no, and you, you don't have to leave the ACNA with a court order. You don't have to mm -hmm. leave. The, you, know, you don't have to involve lawyers. You call your bishop and say, we, we're moving uh, our church to a different diocese, province, or we're downgrading to whatever. And so, yeah, ACNA has a good system in place for leaving. Maybe it's too easy. I don't know. Yeah, but it's, it's happening here and there uh, in a very minor way. Uh, you wanted to talk about uh, Hillsong. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Hillsong, really have never been a, a fan of their music. It's kind of my 70s Kumbaya song, is it? Every time I hear a, a Hillsong, I'm like, oh no, Kumbaya, my lord. And so let's talk about the church Hillsong. Hillsong, I call it a movement. It began in Australia, it's expanded around the world. It's a, sort of a non denominational, charismatic type. Yep. And it's known particularly for their worship. And they basically built a business model that's very successful. Um, try playing a Hillsong song on YouTube and you'll get, get a strike faster than you know why. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, the founder of Hillsong uh, abused some people in the 70s, sexual abuse. And his son, who is the leader of Hillsong now, Brian Houston, was brought up to trial in Australia for allegedly covering up his father's criminal sexual abuse. And on uh, Thursday, yesterday, he was found not guilty by a court in Australia. So this is good news for the Brian Houston. Uh, he's not going to go to jail. But it did raise some uncomfortable things about the cu culture of churches uh, it's not just the Catholics and the Anglicans who like covering up and shifting people around and hiding in inconvenient facts. The Hillsong people went through it too. But in Brian's case, it didn't amount to criminal conduct. It was just unwise, some sure. of the stuff he did. Well, he avoided one of the greatest traps in Christianity, and that's mm -hmm. guilty by association. Mm -hmm. You know, this is your father, of course you're guilty. And uh, uh, that's very hard to do. Uh, since Christians have lost the benefit of the doubt. In but, you know, Australia, Australia is a much smaller country, and therefore Hillsong's presence footprint in Australia is much bigger, and we don't have anything comparable in the United States uh, to match Hillsong. You, you, you just think of somebody like Joel Osteen or Pat Robertson, but you have to multiply it by, by 10 yeah. to get the sense of its importance on the contemporary yeah. Christian scene in Australia. So for the United States, Hillsong is music. It's nothing, and another group of churches. It's nothing more than that. Yeah. Um, uh, and they haven't been too controversial, except that song, Oceans, just drives me crazy, George. But that's that's just me. Sorry. Backing out. Uh, we got a couple more stories we're going to cover. Let's skip them for next week because we hit the one-hour mark. Yeah. Can we, can I, actually, can I'd like to do one because it involves some of the comments we got last week. Oh, please. Okay. Yeah. People, we're going. So many of you had desired us to go more than an hour. Guess what? You got your wish. Go, George. Last week, we talked about how the U.S. State Department has been playing hardball with Jamaica. And I identified the partnered gay man as the ambassador. And that was a mistake. I think it was the charge d'affaires. Yeah, it's and where diplomat. The, yeah. Diplomat a senior diplomat at the U.S. Embassy, where the U.S. demanded you, Jamaica changed its laws on marriage to accommodate the U.S. Well, this is all part of a pattern of the Biden administration. Um, last month, the U.S. told Uganda, no more money for you, behaving like the soup Nazi, uh, to Uganda because Uganda has passed uh, the anti-gay laws. Well, Ghana is about to pass some anti-gay laws that are more or less the same as Nigeria, as uh, Uganda's. And earlier in the year, the Archbishop of Uganda was called up to Lambeth Palace and told by Justin Welby, don't do it. And last week, the U.S. ambassador to Ghana said that if Ghana passes these laws, uh, the U.S. will cut off aid 
just as we cut off aid to Uganda. And, and the and Jamaica, bishop yeah. of a and well, we haven't cut off aid to Jamaica, but we cut off aid right. to you we, we, because Jamaica caved. Uganda yes. refused to cave. And Ghana's government and church leaders, including the um, bishop of Accra and the primate, have all said, fine, we are not going to allow your domestic issues drive our culture and our morality. If, you know, we would rather be poor, but be faithful to God and not be uh, puppets of the U Americans or English, whoever it is making demands. This is all part of the neo-colonialism that the word that people came up with in the comments to describe the policy of the French and the Americans and the English in Africa and Asia was neo-colonialism. Right. And we're seeing this in such uh, unabashedly, they don't, the, the US, the, the Biden administration doesn't hide uh, these things. In other words, unless you do X, we're gonna do Y. And to tell Ghana, you know, if you want money so people don't starve or so you have schools or hospitals, follow the latest fad in the United States on gays and transgenders and stuff. And part of the, all this stuff is tied together of Western church neocolonialism, Western government neocolonialism. And, you know, that the, the new military leader of, of Niger um is is the true revolutionary here he's basically saying cut off your aid africa for the africans let us develop our own cultures our own economies quit stealing our natural resources with these unfair trade agreements and quit telling us how to think and do and act so all this stuff is it's the same story, just different actors, different characters, but the same storyline of the big bad West making demands of the poor and impoverished developing world. Yeah, and it continues. Uh, George, your monotone, soft, sultry voice has put your dog to sleep. Which yes, one's snoring uh, now? <laughs> well, that's Julius, uh, dad at my feet. He's snoring. Right. But uh, Cos Cosmo is nosing around, seeing if there are any lizards or anything to eat in the office here so. well it, it's a smoky day now in in madison wisconsin but we're going to go find something to do on a friday i uh, hope you guys enjoy the show i'm kevin Coulson, and i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 817 of anglican unscripted <laughs>